Good evening. The topic of spirit photography has been around almost as long as photography itself. If you wish to hold fast to your belief in real spirits leaving their mark upon photographs, you may want to leave now. Although photography has been around since the 1830s, it wasn't until the 1860s that spirits suddenly began to show up in photographs. Apparently, it took 30 years for ghosts to figure out how to use the new science. Interesting that it happened around the same time when photographers figured out how to create double exposures. The first to do this was an engraver by the name of William Mumler around 1861. Now, there was a rumor going around about someone named W. Campbell, who was alleged to have taken a photo of a boy ghost one year earlier, but no one has ever produced his full name or the photograph, and as far as I can see, it's just another urban myth created in a lame attempt to validate spirit photography. But unlike the non-existent Mr. Campbell, Mumbler's case is documented fully with quite a number of photographs still in existence today. These photos were claimed by William Mumler to be spirits that were visiting his studio at the convenient time of these photo shoots. As it turned out, the ghosts were more than happy to cooperate and pose for him on cue. After the authorities caught wind of this miraculous ability, they cried fraud and took Mumler to court. Even P.T. Barnum got into the act. Acting much like the 19th century version of James Randi, Barnum had a photographer friend of his take his picture, making sure the late Abraham Lincoln was in the shot. Efforts to prosecute were futile, however. It seems like the people of the time were more than ready to believe they could have their pictures taken with ghosts, and Mumler was acquitted of the charges. So how did Mumler create the spirit photographs? Well, in that time, the method of photography most used was the wet plate method. This involves pouring a coating of collodion chemical onto a glass plate, then placing the plate into a container of silver nitrate that sticks to the collodion. The result is a light-sensitive coating on the plate. The protective plate is then taken to the camera and inserted. Removing the lens cap causes the image to be burned into the plate. The exposure time could be anywhere from 10 seconds to a couple of minutes depending on the light conditions. The plate is then removed and taken to the dark room where a coating of developer and then a fixer is applied to it. What you have left is a glass negative image or you can process it into a positive image as well. Then it's just a matter of putting the negative into an enlarger and shine light through it onto photo paper and developing the print. Or you can create a contact print by just laying the glass negative directly on top of photo paper and shining a light through it. The thing is, there are several ways in which you can create a double exposure effect with this method. You can simply make a glass plate positive and cut it to fit inside the camera body, which in those days would have been fairly easy to do. Then just place the new plate onto the camera and take the photo as normal. When it's developed, you have one glass negative with the ghost already on it. Another way is to take a photo of your subject, reinsert this plate into a second camera set up on your ghost and take another exposure. And finally, you can simply lay two glass negatives one on top of each other when printing. The first containing the cutout of your spirit's face and the second being that of your subject. Laying one on top of the other will make the ghostly print. But if your wife and friend is in on the prank, you can simply do what's called a walk-away photo. In those days, to get a decent picture of someone, your subject would have to stay perfectly still. If you had an exposure time of one full minute, for example, then you could have a second person in the shot for only 30 seconds of that time, and then just have them walk off, leaving the other behind for the remainder of the time. The result is a partially exposed ghost. This famous photograph was more than likely one of those. The subject coming into the frame and sitting down in the chair halfway through the exposure time. 
When print film came along, suddenly everyone became photographers and people discovered the double exposure thing on their own. Most of these were accidental and happened quite often. In your latter-day 35mm SLR cameras, a safety feature was in place that would not allow you to take another shot until you advanced the film. But way back in the day, that wasn't the case. You could take photo after photo after photo on a single frame of film until the cows came home. For example, taking a picture of a church statue and then taking another of a stairway without advancing the film could result in this kind of a photo. If you had darkroom experience, then you could also manipulate separate images together with film negatives just like the way they did with the glass ones. Just stack two negatives in the enlarger at the same time. Once you develop the print, you could take a picture of that and end up with an original ghost right on the negative. Which brings to mind a famous spirit photograph taken in 1995 by photographer Tony O'Reilly. It was taken in Shropshire, England, and shows the old Wem Town Hall burning. As the story goes, it wasn't until he developed the film and made a print that he noticed the figure of a girl standing amongst the smoke and flames. Many who saw the photo speculated that it was the spirit of Jane Cherm, who died in another fire in the town hall in 1617. A photography expert even examined the photo negative and exclaimed that there was no sign of tampering. There was even a correlation between the face of the spirit girl and a recent crop circle. But the thing that everyone didn't know was that the negative was just a shot of a faked print created using two separate photos. One of the fire taken by O'Reilly and the other a cutout of this girl from this photo. Another easy way to create spirit photographs is by simply staging the scene. An obvious example would be to have someone dressed in a bedsheet over his head standing nearby. Here is an example where young girls cut paper fairies out of a book to use in their photographs. The cool thing about photos is that they are only two-dimensional, so flat images can be inserted into any scene. Take this UFO that's flying over my neighbor's house, for example. No, it's not Photoshop. To prove it, here's a short video of it. Just a paper cutout taped to a sheet of plexiglass. In Tombstone, Arizona, there's a town actor, poet, songwriter, and teller of tall tales named Terry Clanton, a direct descendant of the Clantons who were gunned down at the O.K. Corral. This story goes that a friend of his was visiting from out of town. Clanton dressed him up and took a picture of him by Boot Hill Cemetery. It wasn't until the film was processed that he noticed the ghost character in the background. It's easy to see that this is not a double image since the so-called ghost appears solid. Terry has several photos like that. Here's one of a ghost hiding behind a bush. Here's another some distance away standing by some scrub brush. But in this photo, it looks as if the ghost is walking up out of the ground. If you ask me, there's just no way that this could be the top half of a mannequin borrowed from several lying around over at the Birdcage Theater located just down the street. There are those who get around the excuse of an allegedly photoshopped image by bragging about it being print film and how the image is actually on the negative as if this will give it some authenticity. Wrong. I just showed you several ways to create spirits on film that, in my humble opinion, is far easier than Photoshop and just as convincing. Here's another one. Taking a photo through a large window may give you a fine perspective of the scene outside, but keep in mind that a reflection of things off to the side and behind you can show up too. Here is a claim of a ghostly image taken with a disposable camera. There is no way to make a double exposure with these types of cameras, and you can't do anything in the dark room because you send the whole thing to get it developed. Here's the photo that made the news in the UK. It's obviously the spirit of a boy, and the story is quite compelling. The short snippet in the sun reads, this spooky image of an unknown boy gave Angie Darcy the shivers when she had her photos developed. 
She took the picture in 2003 in Evercreech, Somerset, but only just got around to having the disposable camera film printed. Angie Forty of Shepton Mallet cannot remember anyone being in the shot when she took the snap, and said the figure, dressed in old-style country clothing, remains a mystery. But unfortunately for the staff writer, it didn't remain a mystery for long. The ghost boy, if you hadn't noticed by now, is none other than Anakin Skywalker. Disposable camera? No. Photoshop. The guy lied. It's always good to remember that the art of hawking ghost photos often involves inventing convincing stories. Have you ever wondered why it is that ghost writing only appears on Polaroid film? Well, Polaroid self-developing photos have the developer solution sandwiched between the outer cover and the photograph. And if you ever wondered why the directions for use always tells you not to handle the photo while it's being developed, I'll tell you why. The reason is that any pressure at all will cause the solution to move away from the area, causing blotching and blank spots. It's easy to scratch words into the film while it's still wrapped in its plastic bag. You then repackage it and re-glue the flap like it's never been touched. You can also use sleight of hand, using a fingernail to scratch crude words on the back of the photo while it's being developed, thus causing the chemical to reveal the ghostly writing. With the advent of digital photography, all hell broke loose in the realm of spirit visitations into our cameras. The ability to instantly capture literally hundreds of images at a time, both day and night, was brought to bear elements of light and shadow and nature that affects photography that have always been known to professionals, but completely alien and mysterious in the hands of generations X, Y, and Z. Sometimes with generations A, B, and C as well. So kids, please take notes. It's 3 a.m. and you're out in the cemetery taking flash photos. You see orbs in some photos, one or two of them. Let's say you're smart enough to know that snow falling could do that and rain falling could do that, but it's not doing either one. In fact, there isn't a cloud in the sky. Here's one thing for you to try. Next time you're out in the middle of a dark clear night, use a strong flashlight and point it straight up in the air. Those little minute droplets you see is dewfall. You can't feel it. You only know it's there from the illumination from the light. And here's the kicker. That flashlight is pretty lame compared to the candle power of your camera's flash. A droplet in front of the flash will light up like a match, and an insect like a, a gnat or a mosquito will glow like my nose after four drinks. Here's some more examples for you, some of which you can find at ghoststudy.com. Basic smoke, water drops, a strap hanging in front of the flash, this is hair, a double exposure, a dirty car window, a photo taken through a sheet of cellophane, here's one I took of a tiki god that has your typical motion light blur. Many people see these things in their photos and honestly have no idea how they got there. Well, I'll tell you how they got there. Some light settings on your digital camera are designed for tripod photos in low light conditions. Some are designed to eliminate red eye problems. But here's how you find out what happened. Right click the photo, then click on properties and then select the details tab. Here is my details tab for the Tiki God photo. And this is my desktop photo of little Missy who passed away several years ago. I like to put her up there once in a while. Anyway, as you can see, the exposure time in the Tiki photo was a full two seconds long. During those two seconds, I first took the flash photo and then turned around. The two lights in the background are what caused the light blur. Here's the photo with a screenshot of the video version overlapping. They match perfectly. Most people know about Photoshop, but simple effects like double exposures can be done with some basic video editors too. Here's one I created by placing two photos in separate tracks and then using a basic chroma key to blend them together. Well, that's enough for now. It's difficult to go over every aspect of this topic in a short amount of time, but in closing, I would just like to say that anything seen or unseen can be believed with the right story. 
Visual imagery has always given credence to tall tales, and the more fantastic the image, the more convincing the story becomes. But remember, they don't call it smoke and mirrors for nothing. This is Super Soylent, and thank you for watching.